So, so to me, this, this quest that I'm a part of, it relates to thinking about the early universe, that's the very big. It relates to thinking about the microscopic structure, that's the very small. But it most of all relates to asking the question of how does, how do, how does a complex world come out of simple laws? And, and that, I think, is the most profound answer to why this is worth doing. Using these tools to share MIT's perspective, MIT's understanding, MIT's vision, MIT's knowledge in a way that will empower people whom I will never meet to change the world. Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. We are at MIT's Open Learning in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We're now gonna be talking about all things physics, all things open learning. I'm very excited to have Dr. Krishna Raja Gopal joining us on the show, hello. Hi there. Thank you so much for coming on. Huge shout out to Sanjay Sarma for introducing us. Thank very, you. Very grateful. And this is such a cool place. We just had Erdina on the show as well. We love open learning, what you guys are doing here. And for those that don't know Krishna's background, he's Dean for Digital Learning and Professor of Physics at MIT. His focuses range from quarks in the microseconds old universe to sharing the best of MIT knowledge and perspectives with learners around the globe. And you can check out Krishna's links below in the bio. All right, let's start things off with one of our favorite questions. What is your current take on the state of our world? Yeah, so I'm not sure how to, where to go with that question, but what, I, what I'll say is that my current take on the state of the world is that now more than ever, um, we as educators at a place like MIT have both a responsibility and an opportunity to make the world a better place via education. And so when you say state of the world, I, I think about how we can make the world better. And, and, and for us, that comes through um, education. And we now have the opportunity to um, think about education, not just of our own students at MIT, which always for us comes first, but to think about education much more broadly and, and really globally. And we'll come to that later. And this responsibility that you speak of is such an eloquent way to describe it. It's these you know, multi-10 plus billion dollar endowment universities that have their put potential to open up and open source a lot of the materials and yeah. distribute them around the world. Yeah. I mean, we'll, we can talk much more about this later, but I, I think of it as sort of what, what we are doing in open learning is turning MIT inside out. <laughs> um, um, and, but we can, we can come back to that a little bit later. That's a the, great analogy the, for it, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, okay, let's get into the journey. So Krishna, who were you as a kid? Where were you, how, did you, how did you get the interest in physics and in even challenging yourself to come into the MIT system? So I, I grew up in Toronto, Canada. Um, I um, was actually born in Germany. Um, my dad's from India. Um, my mother was from Germany. Um, they met as students in England. Um, and then uh, my dad finished his PhD and took a postdoc in Munich where my mother was. Um, and so I was born in Munich. So I actually uh, like to say I'm one of the Bavarian Rajagopals. Um, <laughs> there, there are not too many of us. Um, so I was born in Munich, uh, but we moved to Toronto in Canada when I was less than a year old. So okay. all my growing up is Toronto. I'm, I'm Canadian, um, although I never played hockey. Um, I uh, went to public schools in suburban Toronto. I would say my, I've been interested in physics really since um, pretty early on at the level of reading popular books. Um, Carl Sagan and the, the popular science books of that day. I, I was a high school student in the early 80s, suburban North Toronto, um, North York in fact. Um, but um, my high school physics teachers were um, the opposite of inspiring. Uh, and actually, I would say my really uh, formative experience in terms of an educator whom I remember and to whom I credit um, a lot of what I did later is my high school biology teacher. Um, I had a tremendous biology teacher in high school who brought the discoveries of recombinant DNA and the beginnings of the, the, the molecular biology revolution brought them into a public school classroom in a way that was inspiring. Um, so I actually went to Queen's University, arrived there in 84. I went there planning to major in biology. Um, and I think that if I had gotten to Queen's University and my Bio 101 class had been the class that Eric Lander now teaches at MIT and that we have an online version of, I would be a biologist today. 
Instead, I got to Queens and um, the biology course that I took in my first year was, um, felt like I was just being asked to memorize lots of stuff. And I had a tremendous first year physics class taught by um, Dr. Chow. Uh, uh, my biology teacher was Den Mr. Reynolds, Dennis Reynolds. Um, and Dr. Chow's physics class, you could, um, you, know, you could ask, you could just keep asking why, right? You, 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 asking questions was encouraged and there was a sense that if you asked in a physics class, if you asked why, there'd either be an answer or if there wasn't an answer, it'd be really interesting. Um, and and um, you know, this was just freshman physics, but the way he taught it was um, a, you had a sense that you were on the beginning of a journey of exploration, of discovery, and, and that really, I think, torqued me back from biology to physics. And you know, I've been a physicist really since undergrad days, I would say. Uh, I had several really great undergrad research opportunities um, in Canada, and then I went to Princeton and did my PhD, which is where I got interested in quarks. Mm -hmm. And um, in fact, al although not in a way that I'll describe now because we understood much less back then, but I was already back then interested in the physics of very hot quark matter and, and the, the, the stuff that filled the very early universe, although we knew much less. So I won't, I won't go back and talk about exactly the things I was doing back then. Uh, but I've been interested in that, other, other physics topics also, but really since then. Um, and then uh, when, for, I don't know how much you want to linger on Harvard and Caltech, but I spent three years as a postdoc at Harvard, um, PhD in Princeton, um, and then I was a year at Caltech, and then I joined the faculty at MIT in 97. In, uh, I've been a physics professor at MIT for 22 years, yeah. um, dean for digital learning for a little less than two years. Yeah. Um, so I want to also understand when you were younger mm -hmm. and you're first getting to, to really taste what science, uh, the biology and the physics and the, your fascination with that, what did it unlock for you that made you dedicate the next even 10 years of your life to it? Um, it was a sense of discovery and understanding, understanding how the natural world worked. Um, Playing a playing a role in sort of in in uncovering the next layers of understanding. Um, you know, I, I one of the things that so I um, I don't do this in a in a in a big sense, but I've gone into um, schools, typically my kids' schools. I've gone into my kids' classes. My kids are now fourteen and sixteen, but as they were growing up, you know, every year I would go into their um, elementary school or middle school classes, and um, one of the things I liked to say when I was talking with um, the little kids was, um, I kind of have to remember how to set it up, but I, I would, I would, I would, you know, spend half an hour with them, and we would, we had done some some stuff, some gee whiz stuff. I would have brought liquid nitrogen or mm -hmm. electromagnets, or we, and and um, I would have gotten them asking me questions. We'd had a, and then I would say, um, 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 if you if you want to. Um, I would always, that's right, I remember how it set up. I would always try to include something that was not understood. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as opposed to things where I was showing them how things worked. I would always mm -hmm. try to find something that I, could, that I could describe to them that wasn't understood. Yeah. Um, and I would say, maybe you'll be the ones who will um, discover how this works. Um, and, and then I would say that if you want to be a scientist and if you want to try to figure stuff like that out, um, you, you today have a big advantage um, over um, most scientists. Uh, what, what's your advantage? And I would let them think about it. And the, the advantage is that they just ask questions, right? Uh, and so what I would tell them is that if you want to be a scientist, don't stop asking questions. So that's my, that's my pitch to, to, the, to, the, to the really little kids is just, you know, little kids, they're natural. They're, they're just, they just keep asking why. It's just, just what they do. And they, they just, if you want to be a scientist, you just have to keep doing that. Yeah, that's a cool perspective that when children come into the world, they're natural scientists. And yes. then somehow the culture and society at large somehow just, it just molds, some, in some ways just molds them into just workers rather than the continuous probing of, of, of the universe with these questions and how things work with these questions. Mm -hmm. And then 
I also really appreciated how you took the initiative yourself with your kids to go into the classroom yeah. and you set up the experiments with the t with the tiny bit of, I don't know how to do that either. Yeah. If you want to learn how to do that, pursue science. Yeah. If you want to learn how to do things that science and society doesn't know, go into science. And, yeah, so one yeah. of the things I would do with, again, I, I do, you know, bring liquid nitrogen in, you know, play with balloons, play with bananas, play with roses, but then I would also have a high temperature superconductor which floats on a magnet. Get them all gather around. You can see the little magnet floating on this sort of hockey puck of high temperature superconductor which is in the liquid nitrogen. You can see it floating there. And then I would say, so what do you think the electrons in there are doing to make it float on that, you know, to make mm -hmm. that magnet float on, what do you think the electrons in that mm -hmm. black stuff are doing? Um, and the kids would try to answer and I'd say, well nobody actually really knows. Um, people have, I mean, people know a lot more than, you know, people know more than nothing, but nobody truly understands how that works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, people understand how low temperature superconductors work, but people don't have a full understanding of how type, high, so that, that was one of my things that I would bring in. Um, and it all, again, kind of, like you said, star starts with your desire to understand that natural world and how it works. Yeah. And that seems yeah. to be a reoccurring theme of a lot of the people that we sit down with, that insatiable curiosity. Exactly. Pro probing the universe with that scientific um, hypothesizing and, and learning. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go into, all right, this is a very complicated field. We've had several shows un un trying to unpack particle physics. Uh -huh. it's, it's, not, it's not easy to wrap our minds around. So I think what we can do is we can start with the notion that um, atoms m make up everything, yep. and that atoms have protons and neutrons in the nucleus, yep. and then electrons orbiting yep. that. Good. Okay. Then, this is where things get a little strange, is that the protons and neutrons on the inside of the nucleus are made up of quarks. Yep. Why is that strange? Uh, because now it's just, it's just I going. Mean, <laughs> for, for all we know, the quarks are made up of something on the inside of the quarks. It's just we haven't... Nobody's built a powerful enough microscope yet to see the to see any structure inside quarks or electrons. So as far as we now know, quarks and electrons are the elementary, featureless, um, indivisible um, components of the world of the world that we're made of, right? So the the quarks are assembled into protons and neutrons. The protons and neutrons make nuclei. The nuclei have electrons around them. So it's all electrons and quarks, but um, you know, that's just what we know based on the microscopes we've been able to build. Yeah. Um, if we could, if we could study the properties of matter with a thousand times um, finer resolution microscope, who knows what we would find. But at the moment, I don't think quarks are any harder to understand than electrons. Okay, so now, uh, you know, double click us a little bit deeper into your fascination with quarks and also how that relates to yeah. the the first parts of the Big Bang and the soup of quarks that was there. Good. So um, um, we, we, um, sci we, we've understood really since the 1970s that if you get to a high enough temperature, protons and neutrons shouldn't exist. Um, that the, at, at high enough temperature, the protons and neutrons will be bumping into each other and smashing, smashing into each other enough in a, in a really high temperature system so that the, they just have to fall apart into quarks. Okay. That's, that's been known at a theoretical level since the 70s, really since quarks were understood. And so we've also known, uh, even for even longer, that the universe began with a hot Big Bang. Um, there's now a TV show um, that, that confirms this fact. Um, um, and, and so if you go back to early enough in the universe, the universe was that hot. Um, was hot enough that there were no protons, there were no neutrons. So this has been, at, at a qualitative level like we're talking here, this has been understood um, really since the 70s. The first papers about the um, quarks in the early universe are from the 70s. Um, but do we know where the quarks came from? Um, and, well, that's the question of what, what, what happened before the Big Bang, and the answer is no, we don't know. Okay, okay. But, um, so what's, what's new in the last, um, 10 or 15 years um, is that we now have the ability to actually make a little droplet of stuff, in, of matter in the lab, which is that hot. Um, mm -hmm. Turns out you need temperatures of a few trillion degrees. Trillions. Trillions of degrees. 
that's not the, it's not, the, the better way of thinking about it is you need temperatures that correspond to the energies associated with the motions of quarks inside of a proton. Um, and, wow. and, and those energies are um, in the hundreds of MeV, so mega electron volts. But if you turn it into a temperature, it's, it's a few trillion, 10 trillion degrees. So how do you make a droplet of stuff that's 10 trillion degrees hot? You build an accelerator, like the Large Hadron Collider at CERN in Geneva, or in fact, these experiments were first done at um, the relativistic heavy ion collider, RIC, which is in Brookhaven, Long Island, not that far from here. Um, and you take two uh, nuclei and, and smash them together. Very simple. I mean, it's an extraordinary piece of technology to do this at the required energies, but you take two nuclei, slam them together at high enough energies, and you will create a little blob of stuff which is um, 10 trillion degrees hot. If you, if you can make a strong, high, powerful enough accelerator, you can make 10 trillion degree hot matter. Um, not a whole room full, not a whole universe full, but you know, one nucleus size full. Okay. And that, that gets through that strong nuclear force that's normally repelling them. Um, actually, this, it, they, it, it has to overcome the electromagnetic force, they're positively charged, but you, these are at such high energies that you can, that they just slam into each other. Um, and you make, the nuclear force is in fact attractive um, once you get close enough. Once you get close enough. Right. And then that will turn two trillions of degrees? Yeah, it, it's, through it's, that? It's, just, it's just you're creating lots of entropy. It's not, um, it's, it's, uh, it's just a, it's a collision, right? You, you slam two Swiss watches together, they break apart into their components. Instead of Swiss watches, you know, if you, if you slam, if you, you know, collide two, sl collide two Swiss watches at 100 miles an hour, right, you're gonna get a pile of screws and, str and springs. Uh, you collide two nuclei at um, 99.99999, a lot of nines times the speed of light, uh, you're gonna get um, a pile of quarks. Um, Percent of the speed of percent light? Percent of the speed, oh, the speed of, light. of light. Yeah. And, and then you get a lot of quarks, and is that, that's the process where we discovered also the Higgs boson, a similar process? Higgs boson, in principle, you make Higgs bosons in these collisions, but it'd be very hard to find them. So for Higgs bosons, you collide protons. Ah. Uh, okay. okay. Um, you, Solely so, protons versus Or, or you could, if you could have, get enough energy, you could collide electrons and make Higgs bosons, although that's, th there, there are reasons why protons are a better choice. But anyway. Do we do any electron collisions right now? Yeah, okay. we do um, okay. at a place called Jefferson Lab in Virginia, but at much lower energies. Um, okay. We had a facility at the Stanford, called the Stanford Linear Accelerator, which did electron collisions. Um, and there is a lot of discussion in the, in the physics community of building a new higher energy electron collider, but that, um, that's for the future. But so what I wanted to say is that, um, these, so you, everyone understood that at high enough energies you could recreate this stuff of the Big Bang, okay? And everyone was right about that, but they were wrong about the following. Um, so before the experiments were done, the expectation was that when you collide two nuclei at sufficient energies, you would free the quarks, the protons and neutrons would fall apart, you'd free the quarks, and there was an expectation that the quarks that would would um, form a gas, basically, a very hot gas. You know, 10 trillion degrees, it's gonna be a gas. Th there were better arguments for this than that, but the expectation was you're gonna form a gas of quarks. Quarks are charged, and so a gas of quarks is a plasma. And so this, this stuff was named before it was made, okay? It was called quark gluon plasma. Um, quarks are quarks. Gluons are the particles that bind the quarks together. So you, the idea was you would have a a plasma, sort of a tenuous plasma of quarks and gluons, which we, we, can, we can leave out. And um, that turned out to be um, not quite correct. Um, it was half correct. Um, and so what we learned, so these experiments started in the year 2000, and what we understood from the experiments by about 2005, so since 2005 we've known that when you make this stuff of the Big Bang, it turns out to actually be a liquid. Um, so in a way that can be made precise, yes, you, you, you destroy the protons and neutrons and you make lo lots of quarks that are not bound up into individual protons and neutrons, but they're also not free. Okay? They don't fly long distances like in a gas. They're always bumping into each other, okay? So it's much more like a liquid. So, so when I, you know, we're having a long conversation, but if, if we sit down on a plane and 
somebody asks me, so what do you do? I say, I study hot cork soup. Okay? And, and that is a much better name than cork glow on plasma because every word in it is correct. It's very, very hot, made of quarks. And it's, it's like a soup. It's a liquid. Every, it's, you know, everything, it's not gaseous. It's, it's an incredibly hot liquid. Um, and it turns out to be a very interesting liquid with interesting properties. Um, and, um, but if, if you'll permit me, I'll, 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 I'll tell a story. Um, Please. So, um, um, in sometime in the late 60s, um, or maybe it was early 70s, a predecessor at MIT named Vicky Weisskopf, a great theoretical physicist from a previous generation, when I arrived at MIT in 1997, Vicky was um, long retired. He was still present. He was very late in his life. I, I met him very near the end of his life, long after he had retired. Um, but so that was 97. Sometime in the 60s or 70s, he was giving an after dinner speech. Okay, and his, his the speech was on the occasion of the 60th birthday of uh, Edward Purcell, a colleague at Harvard. And Purcell had done some great work on fluid flow, hydrodynamics. Um, and Vicky wanted to honor him. And so he gave this speech. It's a magnificent um, speech. And one of the things he said was to, to honor Purcell for his work on fluid flow was he said, I think if you take a group of the best theoretical physicists in the world and you put them on a desert island um, and you give them the laws of quantum electrodynamics, how electrons interact with nuclei. You know, you give them the, 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 the laws of nature that describe electrons and nuclei and ask, what do these laws describe? So Vicky said, I think that um, um, a good student could have figured out that they describe atoms. You take one of these nuclei, you put electrons around it, and it describes atoms. Anyone who had learned quantum mechanics could probably have figured that out from the laws. And a really good theoretical physicist, um, um, and sorry, and, and that student could then have realized that gases exist, because what's a gas? It's just a bunch of atoms flying around. And he said, and a really, really good theoretical physicist could have actually figured out that solids are a possibility, that these laws of nature describe solids. Um, but he said, I don't think any theoretical physicist, given the laws of nature, could have predicted that liquids exist. Mm. Um, he said, liquids are much too hard to understand. You know, it takes an Edward Purcell to understand liquids. Liquids, solids are what happens when all the atoms just stop moving. Um, gases are what happens when all the atoms are flying around. Mm -hmm. But who could have predicted liquids? Anyway, so he gave this after dinner speech. Um, and so Vicky was right because um, nature gave, not on a desert island, but nature gave all the theoretical physicists on the planet Earth the fundamental laws of how quarks interact. Those were discovered in 1973. So every theoretical physicist on the planet has known the laws of nature as they apply to quarks since 1973. And we had until the year 2000 because nobody, did the ex nobody reproduced this stuff until the year 2000. Everyone thought it was a gas. And then in the 2000, the experiments were done, it turned out to be a liquid. So all the theoretical physicists on the planet Earth had, had 30 years to work on it, and none of, nobody predicted that quarks could be a liquid at these temperatures. So it was a great discovery wow. from the early 2000s. And what I do now is really to, to ask, well, how, how can these fundamental laws of nature that we can write down on a sheet of paper, how do they describe a liquid? Where does that liquid come from? Um, what are its properties? If you could study it with a microscope, what would you see? What's its phase diagram? Um, how does it, does it, does it, are there, are there other phases of, of quark matter? Um, and a way of saying why this is interesting. So the quick, again, you're the person I meet on the airport. The quickest answer is how cool is it that we can recreate the stuff of the Big Bang, make a little droplet of Big Bang matter and study its properties, right? That's the quickest, but that's actually to me not the most profound answer to why this is interesting. Um, um, for me, this, it, it, so if you think about the great quests of physics, um, there's um, thinking about the, the very big, so thinking about stars, galaxies, cosmology, the Big Bang. Um, there's thinking about the very small, um, um, 
at, you know, as you started us off, matter is made of atoms, atoms are made of nuclei, nuclei are made of protons, protons have quarks in them, what's the smallest structure? So those are, those are two of the sort of big frontiers of physics and always happen. But there's a third, and the third is how do you complex materials come out of simple laws, okay? Um, the laws of nature can be written on a t-shirt. Um, you've got the wrong t-shirt. Uh, <laughs> but they, they, There's I, some of the beautiful, complex laws of yeah, nature. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're, yeah. They're, they're, the laws of nature can be written on a t-shirt. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and yet those laws um, describe um, solids, liquids, gases. They describe um, magnets. They describe um, 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 superconductors. They describe... Um, Ferromagnets, they describe antiferromagnets, they describe high temperature superconductivity, they describe wood, they describe metal, they describe glass, they describe life. So how, how does complexity come from simple laws? And, and that's to me the third great frontier of physics. Um, and where this hot quark soup comes in, it is, I think in a real sense, it is the simplest complex matter there is, mm -hmm. okay? It's, the, it's certainly the first. Um, it is the first complex form of matter that formed in the universe. The universe was a microsecond old when this stuff filled it, and um, um, there, there, it, it's, it was the earliest complex form of matter. Um, and, and it is also, in a sense that's hard to make precise, it's the form of complex matter that is closest to the fundamentals. And that's, that's not a precise notion, but, I, but I, I, I feel that it's the case. And so I think our challenge is to understand how these laws describe this matter. And I think if we learn how to do that, that could help us understand how, how fundamental laws describe other forms of complex matter. So, so to me, this, this quest that I'm a part of, it relates to thinking about the early universe, that's the very big. It relates to thinking about the microscopic structure, that's the very small. But it most of all relates to asking the question of how does, how do, how does a complex world come out of simple laws? And, and that, I think, is um, uh, the most profound answer to why this is worth doing. Yeah, there's a lot to be able to figure out about that process that you're talking about. How does this complex world we live in come out of such simple laws from yeah. the Big Bang until 13.8 billion years later, a yeah. civilization on a rock orbiting a star and all of the complexity of the laws that have now evolved from us, mm -hmm. our complex world as well. But that's too hard for me. This is, yeah, <laughs> and we're not even talking about how the brains inside of us are interacting, all right. eight billion of us. Also too hard for me. Yeah, this is all extremely interesting for the kids that we can inspire to tackle these challenges exactly. now. And I, this is a good segue into the question I want to ask you about. What are you teaching right now? What are the kids learning right now in the physics classes? What are they trying to probe about physics to give us a better understanding of our world? Um, well, I have I have PhD students right now um, who, you know, a PhD student it's it's a very much an apprenticeship mode of learning. So I would say I would say we are working together to understand exactly what we've just been discussing. Um, if you ask sort of more broadly, um, um, you know, we have um, I think the world's best physics department here at MIT, um, and we have great strengths across the board. Uh, I think the biggest development in physics in the last couple of years is the discovery of the gravitational waves from two black holes in spiraling into each other and colliding. You know, that um, um, piece of apparatus called LIGO, which made that discovery, that was a, a, the conceive, first conceived by Ray Weiss here at MIT in, at the, in the late 60s. Um, Ray and his colleagues, um, um, you know, Done a, done a remarkable, made a remarkable contribution to our understanding of the universe by allowing us to hear those gravitational waves for the first time. Um, and that, you know, that kind that flows into what we teach our students. We um, 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 have a sophomore level class where you get an introduction to relativity, um, and then we have a um, class that is taken by many of our juniors and seniors, although it's called a graduate class, a lot of our juniors and seniors take it, where you learn general relativity for real. And certainly in that second class, but to some degree in the first, you get a sense of um, 
the science behind gravitational waves. Um, that's an example of something that, that we teach right now. Um, we have a great quantum mechanics sequence. Um, one of the few universities with a three-course undergraduate quantum mechanics sequence, and then you can follow that up by taking two or three different classes on quantum information, which is another um, frontier direction. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, lot of um, excitement and activity as people are uh, both trying to build a quantum computer and trying to um, understand if somebody built a quantum computer, what could it do? and trying to understand what this teaches us about um, quantum information in many other contexts. Um, that also, that, that's another example. Um, I, I could keep going. We've, we've got, um, I won't say we do everything, because we don't, um, but, but we have um, you know, a big enough department. Um, we have about 70 physics faculty at MIT mm -hmm. um, out of the 1,000 faculty at MIT. Um, we have, if you look at our undergrads, we have 1,100 undergrads per year, um, about 80 or 90 of whom major in physics. Um, that makes wow. physics the fourth largest major at MIT. Wow. Um, so we, we um, have a big impact on the world by teaching both undergraduates and PhD students. I think we're the, I'm not sure if this, uh, this I think we are either, either the largest or very close to the largest department in the United States, I won't say for the world because I'm not sure, in terms of number of PhDs that we, uh, the number of students who complete a PhD in our department. So we have people doing all kinds of amazing things, whether it's gravitational waves, quark gluon plasma, quantum information, um, biophysics, yeah. you know, cold atoms. Um, um, you know, it's the kind of place where you sit down with your colleagues at lunch and, some, and, 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 and you sit down with a colleague whom you haven't seen in a year and there's something cool they've done in their group or in their lab that they tell you, and so you want to have something to tell them. You know, it's a it's a place where people are making discoveries, and um, where that's just that's that's just um, that's just what we do, um, and it rubs off on the students. And the potential that we have with more students getting involved in physics are things like being able to have an abundant source of, of, of energy through nuclear fusion. We have mm -hmm. something like quantum computing, which can run the super intelligences that we plan on, on building. So this is extremely pressing for us. Yeah, to, so, so yeah. fusion, I want to give credit to another. So we have a nuclear science and engineering department at MIT. Mm -hmm. And um, by the way, one of the things about MIT, 1,000 faculty, 70 in the physics department, um, this is an out-of-date number, but about 10 years ago, one of my colleagues um, got you know, the, the, the listing of all 1,000 MIT faculty as, 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 as we were back then and counted the number of MIT professors who had a degree in physics who were not in the physics department. Um, and at that time, there were about 115. So there are actually more MIT professors with degrees in physics outside the physics department than inside it. Um, so physics is everywhere at MIT. Um, yeah. Um, well, it's, it's in many places, and including in nuclear science and engineering. So you mentioned fusion. Um, that is physics for sure. At MIT, it's in our nuclear science and engineering department. And um, they, have you heard of SPARC? S-P-A-R-C? Uh, teach me what that is again. So you should get someone to come talk with you about SPARC. Um, so, the world has this huge project called ETER, which is being ah ETER. So, so yes. Spark is going to clean ETER's clock. What? So, so, so hopefully. Um, so, ETER is being built in France. It has major U.S. participation, but there's lots of countries involved. It's um, the idea is that it's going to be the first fusion um, device that produces more energy than it takes to run it. So, it will be a, a net producer of energy for the first time. Oh, is um, Spark at the engine? No, uh, it's maybe it's part of the engine. It's part. I think it Could might be. Okay, okay, cool. But, but okay, um, Eter, twenty billion dollars been spent on it so far. Um, many more tens of billions yet to be spent. It's it's, gonna, it's taking twenty years at least to build. Um, nope, we don't. We I'm sh hopefully it'll, hope it'll work, but it's still a long way away. It it's like sixty or seventy meters tall or in diameter. It's it's big in every sense. It's, it's big in size, it's big in complexity, it's big in expense, it's big in time duration. And so our friends here at MIT decided to ask, well, could, can we, with modern technology, build a smaller tokamak? Yes, yes. Okay. 
So Spark is, it's only two meters instead of 60 meters, roughly. I don't know the, that's the scale of it, roughly. And Tokamak is the, is it, the cutting edge nuclear fusion technology. Yeah, and it's, you need a, you need a magnetic field to confi confine that hot plasma, and there, the idea of the people building, designing, and hopefully building Spark is to use much stronger magnets. Um, Interesting. And so you can confine this plasma in a much smaller volume if you have much stronger magnets. Yeah. Um, and I think the physics is completely sound. Um, the engineering is a real challenge. Yeah. Um, but they basically, so that our nuclear science and engineering department, our colleagues in that department, are basically trying to make an end run around ETER. They're trying to build a smaller, faster, cheaper, hotter tokamak that'll achieve um, the goals of ETER before ETER is, a, is ever finished. Um, so this is a good place to, to come if you're interested in fusion also. Yes, yes. All right, let's do some of our, uh, our digital learning, our open learning. So you ended up, uh, as you were associate head of the Department of Physics, you ended up having an MITx freshman physics course in junior lab, and then a MOOC mm -hmm. on quantum mechanics and quantum field theory. So that's kind of your transition into the right, digital I, learning. I, I helped my colleagues build all the things you just said. Yes. Yeah, I wasn't. Cool. You know, so basically, when I was associate head of physics, this world of digital learning was just beginning. Um, Sanjay was our pioneer um, here at MIT. Um, um, I was associate head of physics. I, I worked with Sanjay to pull together the resources to find the people to do all the things that you just said. Um, I was the, you know, we worked together. I was the, the person from the physics side. He was the person from the digital learning side. And we did a bunch of cool things. And now um, I'm, I'm here trying to do those same kind of cool things, but across MIT um, as, as Dean for Digital Learning. But the way I got into this was, as you said. And then w what was, you know, you really, you, there was likely a profound realization when the subjects that back in the time that you were going through the process of education, like you started saying at the very beginning of the show, you turned it inside out, made yeah. it accessible globally, and you were like, wow, we're recruiting yeah. 100,000 students or more into so, so one way of saying this is that when, you know, so I was doing very well as a professor of physics at MIT, thank you very much. Now Sanjay comes and starts asking me whether I would like to um, put a lot of time and effort into being Dean for Digital Learning, which is now my principal responsibility. Um, how did he twist my arm into doing that, right? I, uh, physics is fun, as we've been discussing. How did he twist my arm into becoming um, becoming a dean? Um, and and um, I think about this um, um, through my kids and my father. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, my personal motivations, um, and they're, they're, they're different, I have to explain. So um, when I say my kids, um, my kids are 14 and 16 now. They're, they're younger than MIT's undergrads. But um, uh, I know very well how my kids learn just from watching them as a parent. Um, and I also pay a lot of attention to how our undergrads learn. And what I see is that um, um, 18 and 20 year olds at MIT or 14 and 16 year olds um, uh, uh, in my home, um, they read books. Um, they read books. Um, if the English class they want to says read Wuthering Heights, they read a book. You know, they read novels. They read you know the biography of Julian Edelman. You know, they read books. But when they're learning something like math or chemistry or physics or you know learning about nuclear fusion um, or learning about tokamak, any of the things we were talking when they're learning about science or engineering. They don't read books. Um, they, they don't, when I learned quantum mechanics, I had a book and I, over the course of a semester with a teacher, I started at the beginning of the book, I worked my way through it. Um, that's not how it works anymore um, because that's not how you learn when you're 14 and 16 anymore. Um, my kids and our students learn in a very hyperlinked way, mm -hmm. okay? And they learn from video, they learn online. Mm -hmm. um, and so, Part of the drive is thinking about how we teach at MIT, how do we teach our students? The students of today, not, it's not me teaching the Krishna of 1980, where I was an undergrad in 84. It's not me teaching the Krishna of 1984, it's me teaching the students of 2019, yeah. okay? And they don't like to sit 
for 60 minutes and listen to me at the front talk. Mm -hmm. And this is not a criticism of me and it's not a criticism of the students. It's because they've realized that there's a better way to learn. Yes. Okay. And we've realized that there's a better way to teach the kind of material that you could teach in a lecture. It's better to break it up into five, six, seven minute video segments, put some active learning in between, some, 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 some questions and answers in between, the next segment to make sequences of, of, of videos, and then to you know, add online problems, which give you instant feedback. You know, when I was a student, um, and until recently, you, you, you at MIT or Queens University, where I was a student, you do a problem set. Yeah. You know, write a pencil on the paper page, you hand it in. 10 days later, you get it back, and it's graded. You never look at it. The and feedback's instant now versus... And the feedback now yeah. is instant. So, so part of the motivation for me is, was realizing that with these tools, we can teach MIT students better. And, be, and, I, and the way I think about that is, is by, by looking at how my kids and our students learn. Okay, so that's where my kids come in, is thinking about how they learn and how, you, how they can learn better. And so then, once you have students at MIT doing this, this kind of online work, then in the classroom, you have hands-on problem-solving experiences, you have um, lab work, you have undergraduate research, you have maker spaces, you have projects, you have collaboration, you have team building, you have all kinds of things that are what make MIT, MIT, but um, um, you can, you can um, free up more of the in-class, in-person time for all of that by using these digital learning tools um, to, to, to um, 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 teach Maxwell's equations um, 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 online. Um, so that, that's part of the motivation. And then the other part of the, the my father, so my father... Um, Can I quick, right before we get to dad, yeah. is just that when you're explaining the difference in the last, let's say, 40 years in what we're doing now with education, it also is starting to, as we're starting to map neural activity, yes. we can really try to dive into what's yes. happening in the brain of, the, of, of people when they're learning this right. way. And, and so we, we now have, yeah. a, we know a lot more from cognitive science and we know that um, it's, 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 you know, you shouldn't make the videos longer than about eight minutes. And here we are making a one hour video, by the way. And, but, but and it depends. <laughs> Sometimes people go for long form, nuanced interview content as well, we're seeing. Um, it really does depend on exactly what is trying to happen in that time frame. Yeah. Like for example, yeah. going, the fact that we're talking, yeah. what makes yeah. this okay, actually, is the fact that we're talking to each other, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, there's, no, there's no time during this interview when I lecture you for more than a mm -hmm. couple of minutes. Couple of minutes, yep. right? And, um, but so... Um, Dialogue, and, dialectic, yes. Yeah, yeah. and... Um, We're hitting the tennis ball back and forth. Right. Learning more about you, about what you're building. Yeah. Yes, the but importance of it. Anyway, also learning in, in problem solving, learning the importance of, of retrieval and repetition, mm -hmm. um, sort of laying it down layer by layer. All of this is informed by what we've learned from modern cognitive science. Um, so, so part of the motivation for me in doing digital learning um, is, is um, helping MIT faculty to, to, to learn how to build and use the tools that allow us to teach our students at MIT better. Okay? Um, and so the drive for that is, is, is as I've described. But then the other half is we have an incredible opportunity to reach the world now. And, and so I, my, I don't think of my, when I say my father, I'm not thinking of my father of, as he is today. I'm thinking of my father in 1950. Uh, my dad graduated from Loyola College in what was then Madras in India in 1950 um, as a, a math major, you know, a first class honors degree in mathematics from Loyola College, 1950. Um, and, and at that moment in India, his opportunities for further professional advancement were quite limited. Um, and what he ended up doing was he taught for eight years at a small college called Alagappa College in Karikudi because that was the job that he could get. Um, and it was only through a certain set of lucky circumstances, you know, some grit, some initiative, some luck, that 10 years later he got a scholarship that took him to Cambridge, England, um, where he did a PhD. And, and from there he ended up, um, you know, he met my mother, I was born, but that's on the side. He, he ended up getting a job as a faculty member at York University in Toronto. But, um, you know, at that moment in 1950, he didn't have, for someone who was really good in math, 
um, he didn't have the opportunity to take the next step. And I think that um, that repeats all over the world today at many, many levels. It could be anywhere on the planet, doesn't have to be India, could be Cleveland, could be um, a Cambridge, Massachusetts for that matter, could be um, a 14 year old who, who, needs, who needs that little extra something, um, could be a, a, a person you know, graduating from, from college who needs help taking the next step, could be someone who's working in their, you know, who's 30 years old, who's working and who needs, that, um, needs to go back and pick up that new skill. All of those things um, were much, much harder um, to deliver, but, but now with these um, online courses that we can build, um, we can build online courses that address all those needs, whether it's um, for professionals learning supply chain management uh, or data science, whether it's for um, kids uh, learning about um, uh, philosophy. We have a, cor a, a an online course on a at philosophy aimed at high school students. Um, whether it's for undergraduates wanting to learn about quantum information and quantum computing, which they can learn from us in, in a, and go much deeper than you can get from most other universities. There are so many ways in which we can add to the education of people all around the world, including people like my father in 1950. Um, and, and so that's the other motivation. It's um, um, using these tools to share MIT's perspective, MIT's understanding, MIT's vision, um, IT's knowledge in a way that will empower people whom I will never meet to change the world. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's, it's uh, um, I think, a really powerful vision, um, which is um, a real achievable goal. Um, you know, where we are right now, we have um, MIT, we've built more than 150 online courses, um, but we, we're far from done. You know, all the ones I mentioned, we, we built, but I told you we have, why, why no linguistics course, right? Mm -hmm. we, have, we actually have three philosophy classes, but mm -hmm. why no linguistics course? Well, we just haven't, the faculty member interested in doing that, um, it just hasn't happened yet, except for the fact that now it's under construction. I have two colleagues who are building a linguist, intro to linguistics course. Why no cognitive science class? Mm. Um, we just haven't gotten to that one yet, but actually we have a faculty member building the intro to cognitive science class. So, so there's, I could, within physics, I could tell you what we have and what we don't have and what we're, you know. So, so we're trying to build out sort of a suite of online courses that represent sort of the best that we can offer. Um, some of them are undergrad level, some of them are master's level, a few PhD level, including one of our very first actually. Um, and, um, um, you know, I'm very proud of what we've done, but we have a lot more to do. And so that's, that's a powerful motivation. Yeah, and this is so wide ranging and everyone, you can check out the links below to the MITx, uh, also to the MicroMasters program, the Open Courseware program. And so this is really, it's, it's building super highways to the knowledge right. and then enabling. And so my responsibility as Dean, Open Courseware, MITx, MicroMasters, and everything we do to support MIT faculty to teach better on campus. That's my job description. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and it keeps me busy. Definitely. And the ability to create the super highway like MIT is doing enables the full flourishing as in the as in the shirt. We see that the seed gets to grow and have lots of fruits yes. for the world. And yes. that's because it got the proper nutrients in the soil systems. And that's the super highways of knowledge, yeah, the basic nice. love, water, food, com yeah. uh, compassion, the basic things, shelter that, that seeds need um, to do so. And now electricity and internet and computers to get the connection to the um, super highway. Also, um, just another thing for everyone to know is that these specific um, phenomenons that you're embedding into all of the MIT's uh, digital learning are, you know, these closed loop feedbacks. You're getting it right away. Yeah, when, we, exactly. when, we, when we gain the ability to do so with simulation, we will embed a quick bit of what did um, Krishna just teach about physics. And then they'll get to address that so, potentially. So you, you can, um, if you want to think about doing that, the um, edX platform which, on which we put all of our um, online courses, it's open source. So you can um, create your own instance, your own open edX platform in which you, you could start doing exactly what you just said. 
That's beautiful. So simulation, we'll have to get to that point where, you know, scaling things up, building teams to be able to do so. And we care a lot about being able to um, embed things like that. That's excellent because that's going to help with the retention of the knowledge and also the fact that it's open through edX is so crucial. Um, and then also um, for the closed loop and also another thing is just this phenomenon of things like um, Bloom 2 Sigma to be able to have a mentor that you can work with on a, as a tutor, a one-on-one -on -one basis that helps you perform so much better than those that are just in a 30 person class with an individual teacher. So we can, you know, we can do a lot better on that still. Um, we have a discussion forum in all of our MOOCs, but it's that's not a one-on-one -on -one mentor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have a discussion forum in which questions are answered by you know, a real person from MIT. That's, that's I think, a really great thing that we're offering, but it's not one-on-one -on -one mentoring. Um, what Erdine is doing with the boot camps mm -hmm. gets a little closer. Yeah. Um, so you, you met with Erdine yes, earlier. Yes. Um, um, so, so the boot camps that Erdine is, is, is um, um, creating, um, include a lot of coaching, um, which is which which comes much closer to that one-on-one um, um, -on -one mentoring, you know. And the, but the way I think about it with our MOOCs is that um, um, Krishna, it could be as simple as just pairing someone that's studying the yeah. physics MOOC to someone yeah. else in that community that's already in academia yeah. or industry yeah. in physics. So we yeah. we wonder, can we use can we employ MIT alumni in this way? I don't. I don't mean employing a little. Can we engage MIT engage alumni? Engage them. Yeah. Can yeah. we engage MIT alumni in this way? Um, we have people who took the MOOC last year who stay in the MOOC this year and play that role. We call them community TAs. That's um, awesome. Yeah. Um, and they just volunteer. They just do that because they want to. Um, um, but what I was really going to say is that I think what we can um, really work hard at doing is to uh, engage with other educational institutions up and down the whole spectrum. You know. If I think in U.S. terms, community colleges, um, two-year colleges, four-year colleges, liberal arts colleges, the whole spectrum, because each of them is filled with educators that know how to teach their students. Okay, um, so we have a great partnership with San Jose City College, uh, which is a community college in in San Jose, uh, and they have created an educational opportunity for their students. Okay, it's it's their teachers doing this for their students, but that opportunity includes some some initial steps. And then there's an MIT online computer science, intro to computer science class, two, two classes in fact from MIT. And then there's several classes, online classes from Berkeley. So San Jose City College picked some of our stuff, some of Berkeley's stuff. They added uh, uh, the, 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 um, the introductory elements themselves. They added um, um, internship opportunities. They added the mentoring. They added the, and so they, they put together an educational opportunity which is, uh, it's better than what they could have done just by themselves because they use the MIT content and the Berkeley content, but it's much better than what um, MIT and Berkeley, we, we don't, we're, we're not skilled at teaching those students, they are, right? Yeah. And so we put out content that they can use to make the education of their students better. Um, and that's what I, I, I love that model. It's, and so I want to see more and more institutions um, asking, given the set of things that um, are out there online, including what we offer, but the, the whole world of online education. Given the set of things that are out there, how can we use those um, online opportunities to make the education of our students whom, whose abilities we know, how can we make their education better? Um, and we're, we're talking with lots of institutions um, in, in this mode. It's been such a great conversation. I have a couple quick questions on the way out. The first question is, what would you say is one of the most crucial skills for young people and even adults to be developing going into the exponential technology age? Um, so I'll surprise you with my answer. Um, but I'll, this is the answer that I give to many people, including my kids. If I think back, so I'm a professor of physics. Um, you know, what I do is very mathematical. Um, there's, there's science that through and through, um, and if you ask me, what did I learn in high school that has been, of the things I learned in high school, what's the most important to my career? What's, what's the answer? Curiosity? I learned that long before high school. Okay, uh, critical thinking? Questioning. That, that, those are all important, but it was how to write. Oh, uh, wow. Um, I, I write reasonably well. I'm not a, I don't write as well as the great writers of the world, but I write well. 
And, and that's been incredibly important to my career. To, it's, it's, you know, you gotta apply for grants, you gotta write papers, you gotta write, you know, um, one pages that persuade your department head or dean of something. Um, um, and I didn't, I learned to write in high school, yeah. you know. Um, I learned math and physics in high school, yes, it's true. But I learned those much better later. Right? I learned them over again. I, you learn math and physics, you learn them over. And if you become a professor of physics, you learn math and physics over and over again at higher and higher levels. But um, I, I feel that it was my high school English and history teachers that taught me how to write, and that's been incredibly important. So my, my advice to, to, the, to the kids, to the little kids, is, is curiosity, critical thinking, keep asking questions, all of those things, and um, um, reading and writing. You know, and and the foundations of math, which um, 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 you know, so the fundamentals. Um, and I think if you have to build that foundation at a very young age, yes. Um, um, and then don't lose the curiosity. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the roots, the roots at a very young age. All right, and then are we in a simulation? Um, I don't think so. And why? Um, uh, well, I have no idea, really. <laughs> you know, that, that, that's, a, that's, of course, a question that um, I don't, if it's a good enough simulation, how could we possibly know, right? So, so, you know, I don't think so, but I have no evidence. I have no evidence that we aren't, right? <laughs> I have no evidence that we aren't. Yeah, yeah. Um, if, but, uh, um, you know, maybe I'm naive, but I think there is a real world out there. Um, I don't think we're in a simulation. But uh, do I really know? No, I can't say I really know. And then the last question is, what is the most beautiful thing in the world? Oh my goodness. Um, hmm. um, when you're in the high Alps and you've, um, um, you know, spent a whole day, um, I don't climb, but I hike. Um, you spent a whole day hiking up to one of the, the high huts, you know, just on the edge of a glacier at, um, you know, you know, around 3,000 meters in the Alps, um, and you're watching the sunset. That's, that's, that's what occurs to me when you ask that question. Um, every summer um, we go to the Alps. Um, most often I pair that with spending time at CERN. Um, where the accelerator that I described is, and so I talk with the scientists there, find out the latest, uh, um, what I, you know, the, the best place to hear the latest unpublished results in my field is the cafeteria at CERN. Um, so I spend time at the cafeteria at CERN catching up, um, and then uh, the whole family, we, we uh, spend time in the Alps. And, um, you know, we, we now, each of the last two summers, we've done, uh, something along the lines of all four of us with an alpine guide, we, um, we do a hike from the valley floor up to that hut at 3,000 meters. Um, that's the strenuous part of the excursion for me. Uh, for my kids, that's just a walk. Um, and then um, that afternoon, they go and do some rock climbing with the alpine guide. And then the next morning, um, they leave at about five in the morning because they're summiting a 4,000 meter peak um, where the alpinist, who um, his name is Robin, he's a great teacher, um, and uh, so they they traverse a glacier, climb a rock wall, summit this 4,000 meter peak, and come down the other side to this other hut down the other side. And meanwhile, my wife and I have done this wonderful hike, you know, out this valley, around, and up the next valley to the other hut. Mm -hmm. We meet the kids the kids there, and then the day three we hike back down. Um, we we uh, have done something along those lines in two different spots in the Alps each of the last two summers, and we're planning our one for this summer. So. These deep immersions into the beauty of Mother Earth. Yeah. Yes. Yes, yeah. Krishna, yes. Thank you so much for coming on to our show. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Thank we would, you. We would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Also, share more content around physics. Share more content around digital learning with your friends, your family, your coworkers, online on social media. Check out the links in the bio below to Krishna's work as well as MITx and all of the other programs. Go and check it out and share it. Support the organizations, the entrepreneurs, the artists around the world that you believe in. 
support simulation. Our links are below. Help us doing, continue doing cool things like in 2020, hopefully building a recording studio, our second one in Cambridge, as well as our first one in San Francisco, so we can actually have a physical location in this second beautiful cluster of intelligent people. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Thank you, and thank you. Thank you, and peace, everyone.